Hi everybody, Dan Ullman, Mike Beer, the DRF.com. Formulator race of the day for Friday is the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Let's take a look at this field. Obviously a grade one for fillies and mares going a mile and an eighth. Head on over to the race of the day event page on DRF.com. Download your free Formulator Pass performances and handicap along with us as we take this stellar field in post position order. Mike, the number one is Champagne Room. Breeders' Cup winner already. She won the juvenile fillies at 33 to 1 last year. It's been an abbreviated campaign to say the least in 2017. Only two starts, although the Remington Park Oaks, that had to be considered a perfect prep. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, basically, this is a, a filly who's really made one start so far as a three year old. And you know what, Dan? That was a big improvement off of what she had done at two. I know that it wasn't the strongest field in the world. She was supposed to win, she was a huge favorite. She got right to the lead in there. I thought she ran really well in that race. I, I don't think she can win this race. Be very interested to see what she does going forward. She does have a positive formulator fact from her trainer, Peter Erton. The past three years, last out winning dirt routers, second off the layoff, 30% and some big prices. $7.19 ROI. 15 to 1 on the morning line. The two is Stellar Wind. We know that Stellar Wind likes time between her races. She came off a two month layoff to finish second by a neck in the Breeders' Cup Distaff way back in 2015. She had a big 2016 campaign. She beat Beholder twice before coming up a little bit short in the Distaff. This year, a perfect three for three. She's won 10 of 15 lifetime. Right. Now she gets three months off before the Ooh, Breeders' Cup. Maybe yeah. that's all the, the right. difference that it's going to make. Well, it's got to be even better. I mean, imagine if it was. It was a six-month layoff, what she could do. That's um, more spirit. Yeah, that's right. That's just more spirit. Listen, she's very clearly a good horse. She's done nothing but run good races her entire life. And she's the morning line favorite in a really tough distaff this year. And she can obviously win this race. I'll be very interested to see um, what kind of trip she gets in this race because it feels like... Um, Paradise Woods, a three-year-old, is going to come firing out of there and make the front in this race. And I think she'll probably go at a fairly fast pace. Um, and this horse, you know, her best races have been when they sort of motivated her to sort of chase another horse and keep up close. And when she's not able to do that, I think she loses a little something. I wonder what kind of trip she gets in this race. And I wonder if it makes her vulnerable. She can be a little bit lazy. If you yeah. remember her races against Beholder, Victor's got to get after her yeah. with about three-eighths of a mile to go to keep her interest. And then when she's emboldened she again and gets into a fight, she stays on. Let's cue that time form U.S. Pace Project and see what we're going to get. Now, Stellar win the number two. We've got her sitting third or fourth down towards the inside with the aforementioned Paradise Woods on the lead, Champagne Room chasing. I think that's how it'll be early. Seven and one. Will it be a blue bar situation favoring horses on or near the early lead? I'm not sure you can rate Paradise Woods. Yeah, I don't think so either. I mean, is it um, to her advantage if she just clears off early in this race? I say yes, it is. Um, on the other hand, don't expect just because you see the blue bar that it favors horses on the early lead that she's going to walk on the lead because I don't think she's that kind of horse. She will make the front in here. She'll probably be clear up front, but she'll be going a legitimate pace. But I like the layoff for a horse like Stellar Wind because her two recent, most recent races coming into this you race, they were tough performances. You should apply for a job with John Sadler. You listen, like, you like I, the timing. Listen, I love the timing between races. They were <laughs> tough races against Barry yeah, she ran well who was in races. really good form. And you know something? I think this filly doesn't take a lot of racing well. I think she was one too many last year before the Breeders' Cup distaff. And I think that contributed to the flat finish. I think he's handled her very well. I think he can make the argument that she's the horse to beat in. Oh, I think she probably is the horse to beat in here. You're, uh, maybe you're right. They did run her four times last year. Now they're running her four times again. Maybe if it was one too many last year, I guess it's got to be one too many this year, right? Right on the button. Mopatism is the number three, and I'm a big fan of hers. She dances every yeah, dance. Close. It just appears that at times she gets thrown to the wolves. When there are races that, you know, she figures on paper, races yeah. like the Summertime Oaks and the Indiana Oaks, she gets trips, which kind of cost her. And then when you throw right. her in against the big girls like this, maybe she's not good enough, but she's a real hard trying horse at 30 to one, and I don't want to knock her too much. No, I don't either. Nice, likable three-year-old filly. She just happened to catch a super tough distaff this year. You could argue that Abel Tasman really benefited when Unique Bella, the winner book favorite for the Kentucky Oaks, went to the sidelines, and then Paradise Woods caught that wet yeah. track in that fast-paced scenario before going on a break of her own right. in the Kentucky Oaks. But let's also say Abel Tasman ran some big races in the Kentucky Oaks, the Acorn, the Coaching Club American Oaks, three of the most prestigious races in right. the country for three-year-old fillies. In the Cotillion last time out, she had a similar situation as the coaching club. She didn't break well. Then all of a sudden, she just took Mike yeah, Smith and pulled her all the way up to the lead where she was battling with lockdown through the turn. She finally put lockdown away. Right. 
and then the good trip did Tiswell beat her. It was a good effort for Abel Tasman. But do you think ne this Abel Tasman, the one that pulls, the one that isn't as professional or willing to settle, is this Abel Tasman showing signs of fatigue after a long campaign? I don't know. I, I don't know what to say about her, her last two races and those the kinds of trips that she got in those races. Because when I watched the Coaching Club American Oaks, I almost just felt like, Really smart move. No there pace. Go. No pace. He rushed her up there and he got her right up on the lead and she withstood the early move and, and held on over a late. Last time, I don't know, it sort of seemed like maybe that wasn't the plan and she just sort of dragged him up there. And at the end of the day, it really cost yeah. her last time. I mean, she, she, ran great. she was best in that race and that was a very tough loss for her. She's just run nothing but good races today. She's a really good three year old filly. And I just sort of feel like in this race, you know, there's nothing they can do about it if she's going to drag her way up to the front again. But I think Smith's taking her back in this race and trying to make one run. And I think it could really work out for her. It took a late a few starts this year to reach her immense yeah. potential. The potential she showed as a debut winner at Aqueduct by the length of the stretch last year, her only start at two. But her last three races have all been good. In the Coaching Club American Oak, she might have been the victim of a little race riding late when she tried yeah. to shoot on through the inside. And Mike Smith on Abel Tasman made it very tight. Then in the Alabama, she destroyed that field. In the Belle Dame, a weak Belle Dame yes. against older horses for the first time. That's she right. just waited in cruise control in behind horses. She was unfazed by the traffic. And when that hole opened up, it was dominant. That was a perfect prep. Yeah, I mean, in a matter of strides, she settled that race. That was a very impressive win, and she was impressive in the Alabama, too. They weren't the two strongest races in the world, but she did what she was supposed to do. She's an improved three-year-old and a still improving three-year-old. I think she could take another step forward in this race. The only thing, there's not any, to me there's nothing not to like about her. The only thing that I really don't like is, is there a horse with more steam on him coming into the Breeders' Cup yeah. than her? I mean, everybody likes this horse. And I don't, and I have no problem with liking her because she's a very likable horse and she could easily win this race, but man, I mean, every she's the only horse here anybody talking about all week. Yeah, everyone is saying she looks great on yeah. the track. The workouts are sensational. All good things, by Maybe the way. she's peaking at the right time. Forever Unbridled, you liked her in this race last year. Boy, she ran her eyeballs out. She just happened to yeah. catch a beholder in Songbird, two for the ages. She's only raced twice this year. The Fleur de Lis was a slow race, but Joe Rosario just basically fell asleep in, uh, on, in the saddle, and you and I could have <laughs> rode that horse. I mean, yeah. she did that on her own. He was merely a passenger. Yeah. It was really visually impressive. And then the personal ensign, I mean, she took down Songbird, admittedly probably not the same Songbird that we saw at two or three, right. but she still had a lot of fight when Forever Unbridled came calling. That last race, a 98 buyer puts her squarely in the mix. And if you think the pace is going to be fast, yeah. you know she's kicking late. Yeah, maybe that's the thing I like even you know most about her in this race. It just feels like they're going to be going in front of her in here. Maybe Paradise Woods just turns out to be really good, gets loose, and doesn't stop. But I think she'll go a legitimate pace and I think that gives Forever Unbridled her best chance and listen I hate the fact that she's only run twice this year I don't understand what that's all about um, the first one as you point out was more it was like a training mile you never even asked her to run and she was just way the best I liked her race last time yeah she cruised from last and I know listen if you want to say it's not the same songbird I'll probably agree with you but it's that also worth pointing out she thing. was loose yeah, on loose the lead thing. she was still running at the end and this horse not only closed her down Closed her down under strong handling. I mean, he never really had to get into her. She's a good horse, and she fits really well in this race. Joel Rosario had ridden her very well. John Velasquez back aboard. He's ridden her yes. great two for two in his career aboard Forever on Bridal. Paradise Woods, three-year-old filly. You could argue she has just as much natural talent as any other horse in this yeah. race. After blowing him away in her two-turn debut in the Santa Anita Oaks, she was all the rage in the Kentucky Oaks, and everything conspired against her. Yeah. Weather pace battle, and I like what Richard Mandela did. He gave her plenty of time after that race. He had to be extremely disappointed with the return effort in the Torrey Pines, but last time out in the Zenyatta, they let her just yeah. rattle her feet early. She got to the front. She dominated that field. Yeah, it was only a four-horse field. They couldn't keep her from the front in that race, and she just crushed that field. I really felt like she looked really good winning in that race, and I know that she never took on a challenge, but she looked really good winning, and you can just tell when you watch her run she has a lot of a lot of ability. It's just a question of, you know, what happens in a race like this where there are four other really good fillies and mares in here, and I know she'll make the front, 
but they're going to challenge her at some point. And so far, when she's been challenged, she hasn't quite been the same horse. I wonder what happens when she gets hooked. But maybe they can't hook her, Dan. She's a fast horse. She's talented. What happened in the Torrey Pines? Was it the awkward beginning? Yeah, the start was didn't it help. the layoff, or was it the track? We know that this Del Mar nah, surface has not too. been kind to several horses, and maybe, just maybe, that's she doesn't true. like the track. That's something to, to keep in mind, that's for sure. Romantic Vision is the number eight. Boy, Rusty Arnold's gotten her good. Found a great spot, though, last time out. That was a grade one in name only, the spinster, yeah. but Romantic Vision has won two in a row. Her buyers keep improving, but she's a fringe player at best in this spot. That's correct. Taking a shot here um, in another grade one, but she is a grade one winner. She's stepping up off of a nice win. She just happened to catch a tough to staff. Stellar win the horse to beat, but as we take a look at our selections, we will try to beat her. Mike's going to try to get it done this year with Shows Forever me. Unbridled, the number six. Two for two this year. Six, four, five, and seven for Mike. I just like everything I've seen and heard from Elaine, except that everyone else seems to like her as well. I think her tactical speed is going to put her in a great spot. I'm going five, seven, two, and six in the grade one Breeders' Cup Distaff. If you are playing the Friday Breeders' Cup card from home, you'll be rewarded when you sign up as a new DRF Bets member. Head on over to drf.com forward slash fall, use the promo code FALL300, and you'll immediately receive a $300 sign-up bonus. Approximate post time for the Distaff. Race number nine at Delmar on Friday, 435 Pacific. Best of luck.